All right, today we're going to look at our final type of hypothesis test. I know you're thinking, Miss Guy, there's another section to the chapter, and there is, but that section is going to show us how our hypothesis testing results match up with our confidence intervals from Chapter 7. So this is our last new type of hypothesis test. So just a little recall for us, we are looking at the, remember it's chi-square, not chi-square, it's not my favorite type of T. It's chi-square. And the symbol for it is that kind of cursive-y, curvy-looking x-squared. It's chi-squared. It's not an x-squared. It is chi-squared. So just so recall about the characteristics of the distribution because we will be drawing it today. We will be sketching it um, to see where our rejection and non-rejection regions are. We didn't have to sketch it when we were introduced to it with confidence intervals, but today we will be sketching it. So I wanted to make sure we did a little recall on what that distribution looks like. So all the chi-square values are greater than or equal to zero, so everything is positive. Chi-square distribution, again, it's a family of curves. We will be seeing degrees of freedom again today. The area under the distribution is equal to one, and the chi-square distributions are all positively skewed. So a few very important things for us to know about this distribution today before we start working with it. And then I do have the formula for you already on your sheet and ready to go. All variables that we are familiar with, but again, we have to be very careful. If you have the symbol S squared, that is your sample variance. So if you are given sample variance, it just goes in, substitutes in for S squared. You don't then square it again. Same thing with we have little sigma squared in the formula. Little sigma squared is population variance. So if you are given population variance, it goes in for little sigma squared. You don't then square it again. So just be very careful with the symbols. Now if you're given standard deviation, standard deviation is just S. So if you're given standard deviation, you would substitute in for S, and then you would still have to square. If you're just given population standard deviation, you would substitute in for a little sigma, and again, you would then have to square. So you have to be very careful with this formula and read very carefully what information you are given. So just be careful with those things. And then n is our sample size. Degrees of freedom for us is still just our n minus 1, like we saw with our t distribution. <coughs> So our assumptions, again, exactly what they say they are, things we get to assume. Sample is randomly selected from the population. Population is normally distributed. The observations must be independent of one another. <coughs> Excuse me. For this one, just like with confidence intervals, we are looking at table G to find our critical values. And also, just like with confidence intervals, I want to make sure I'm very upfront about this. I know some of you have really taken a liking to those calculator programs for our z-tests and t-tests. There's not one for chi-square. So everybody has to use the table. Everybody has to use the formula for chi-square, just like with the confidence intervals. So as we're doing things today, you can search all you want in your calculators. You're not going to find anything for it. So we will be using table G. The one thing I do want to highlight, and we will talk about this as we do some sample problems, it gives the area to the right of a critical value. That's very different for us. We've been working with the standard normal distribution a lot, and that table gives us the area to the left. So be very careful. Chi-square gives us the area to the right. Degrees of freedom, we talked about this with confidence intervals. Once you hit 30 in the table, the table goes by multiples of 10. So you're going to use the closest, smaller value. Just like we saw with the T distribution, use the closest, smaller value. So for example, if your degrees of freedom are 47, you are going to round down and use 40. So just be careful with that. I know it's closer to 50, but to keep things more accurate, we actually round down and use that table. So since everybody has to use the table, before we get into a full-out five-step hypothesis test, 
I want us just to focus on finding those critical values. And that's what I want us to focus on for this. And we will also go ahead and just practice stating our hypotheses as well. We're going to use, we have little sigma squared, so it's the population variance at 225. So let's just go ahead. And I want to go ahead and have us state our hypotheses because I want us to get used to the symbols we need. We're going to be looking at, in this case it's little sigma squared, so we're looking at population variance, and we'll also look at standard deviation this chapter, or excuse me, this section as well. So we have a right, whoops, have a right-tailed test. So remember our null hypothesis is always going to state there's no difference. And I'm just using the value I've been given. If you're wondering where I got 225, just using the value that was given. Again, this isn't going to be all five steps. We're just going to state the hypotheses, get reintroduced to those symbols, and then we will look at finding the critical values and actually sketching the, the picture, the distribution. So if we have a right-tailed test, my symbol needs to point to the right, so I'm going to have a greater than and we still have our 225. So I want us just to state those hypotheses, again, just being introduced to getting reacquainted with those symbols for our variance. <coughs> all right, so what we have to do, let's jot down first of all, we know it's right-tailed. Our degrees of freedom will be 18 minus one. So degrees of freedom will be 17 and then we are given our alpha value is stated right there for us. So we're going to go with a little sketch. I'm going to sketch this out first. This one is unique. Remember, everything is positive. Everything is positive. So I'm not going to draw a bell-shaped curve and then just put a line down the middle and put a zero there. This is all positive. And it also says that the distributions are positively skewed. So that means a good bulk, a good bulk of our data is over here on the left, and then it tails off to the right. So it's skewed to the right. Positively skewed means also right skewed. So a big bulk of our data is to the left, and then the tail piece goes off to the right, skewing our data towards the right or that positive end of things. Now we do have a right tail test, so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of chop off that right tail for us. And now we have to find that critical value. That's what we're in search of. So I'm going to switch here to table G. There we go. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so table G. And table G is also on page 791 in your book if you want a closer picture of it. I don't know why this isn't letting me zoom. There we go. There we go. All right, so with table G, we have... Oop, it won't let me zoom and draw at the same time. All right, so for table G, we had our degrees of freedom was at 17. So our degrees of freedom at 17. And then our alpha value, we just leave alpha right as is. And our alpha was 0 0.05. If it's a right-tailed test, you use alpha right as is directly from your table. Follow your row for 17 over. Follow the column for 0 0.05 down. So 17 was our degrees of freedom, so I found that value over on the left. Our alpha, it's a right-tailed test, so we get to use alpha as is. It was 0 0.05. <coughs> so our critical value is 
27.587. So our critical value is 27.587. And again, it is a right-tailed test. The table is giving us areas to the right. Next up, left tailed test. Left tailed test. We're still using little sigma. <coughs> little sigma squared, 225. And now we want a left tailed test. So just a refresher here on the three different types of tests we have and what that looks like when we state our hypotheses, actually picking that out. Our degrees of freedom we need before we go to the table. Sample size minus one. Now for a left-tailed test, we have to get ourselves to that left side of the distribution. We have to get ourselves to the left side of the table. So in order to do that, we have to do one minus our alpha. So we're gonna do one minus our point one zero. So very similar to finding when we had a right tailed test, that was similar to finding chi square right for our confidence intervals. Left tailed test is similar to finding chi square left with our confidence intervals. So before we can go to table G, you wanna subtract your alpha from one, and we still just do our degrees of freedom is all we do. So if we go to table G, our degrees of freedom, we were at 22. And then now our chi-square, or excuse me, our alpha value, we have to do one minus our 0.1. So we got 0 0.90. So notice that 0 0.90 is over on the left side of the table. So for a left-tailed test, you need to get yourself to the left side of the table. So we follow the row for 22 over. We follow the column for our 0.9 down. We have 14. 0 0.042. I know it's hard for some of you to see that further in the back. If you have your book open, it's a little easier. So again, you find your degrees of freedom in that left column, and then you find your appropriate value in that top row. Remember, you have to do alpha minus 1 for left-tailed test. You should end up on the left side of the table to find a left-tail critical value. So let's draw, and we didn't draw our picture before we went to table G, sorry about that. Let's fix that now. Again, everything's positive, and then it trails off to the right. Now this is a left-tailed test, so it's gonna look a little different on a positive skewed distribution, but we still do want that left piece shaded in. On a chi-square distribution, it's not, it's not really a left tail like we saw in our standard normal or our T distributions. It's not so much of a tail, but it is that left end piece of the distribution. And so our critical value, we had 14.042. <coughs> so that would be our critical value. So I still want to shade in that left again tail piece, it's not quite as tail looking as with our standard normal or T distributions. But we still do want that left end shaded in. To get that critical value, we did have to do one minus our alpha. We have to get over on that left side. Third and final one, and then we'll go through and we'll do a full five step and using that test value formula. For a two tailed test, for our hypotheses, it's always nice just to have a refresher. Two-tailed test means we have an equal, not equal.
And then we have degrees of freedom, sample size minus one. <coughs> now, when you find the critical values for this two-tailed test, it is just like finding chi-square right and chi-square left. So the first thing we have to do is we have to divide alpha. We have to divide alpha by 2. So 0 0.05 divided by 2. 0 0.025. We're going to use this for the right critical value. Just like we found chi-square, right? Then we have to get ourselves over to the left side of the table. So we have to do that one minus piece. So one minus that alpha over two. Oops. And that's what we're gonna use for our left critical value. Use for the left. When I have the CV up there, that's a V. Sorry, it looks kind of like a U. There we go. CV, I'm just abbreviating critical value. So finding the critical values for a two-tailed hypothesis test is the same as finding chi-square right and chi-square left for our confidence intervals. It's the exact same process. We can go ahead and sketch the distribution before we go to the table. It's kind of up to you, however you want to do it. Again, we're positive skewed, so bulk of the stuff is on the left, and then it, more of the tail piece looks off to the right. But again, it is two tail, so they will both be, both tails will be shaded, or both end pieces. And you will still have two critical values. It's not going to be a nice plus minus, though, like we saw with standard normal and with our T distributions. So if we go to table G, there we go. Our degrees of freedom, we were at 14. And then we did alpha divided by 2, so 0.025. Do you have any toys for your backpacker? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so 0 0.025 for the right, 26.119, 26.119 is going to be over on the right, and then for the left one, we have 0.975, and follow that down. Notice they are equidistant. If I put that kind of imaginary line down the middle of my table, the right critical value and left critical value, they'd be equidistant from that, from that middle line. So we have 5.629. 5.629. Let me make that bigger for you again. So three different situations for critical values, depending upon if you're left, right, or two-tailed. For our other situations, all we really had to remember was for two-tailed, divide alpha by two. Otherwise, everything else was, I just kind of use it as is. So just be careful with these. And again, there's no calculator shortcut to find those critical values. There's no inverse chi-square anywhere in your calculator. So just be aware those will take some practice. So now that we've specifically looked at the critical value piece, let's go ahead and see what a full-out five-step hypothesis test would look like for our variance or standard deviation. So we have a researcher claims that the variance of the number of forest fires in the United States is greater than 140. For a 13-year period, the variance of the number of forest fires in the United States is 146. Test the claim at alpha equals 0 0.01. All right, and I get it. It's the section for variance and standard deviation, so of course that's the test we're going to run. But come test time, again, we have to be able to pick out when to use it. So big keyword, 
claims that the variance, the variance. <coughs> so that's how we know that what we are testing is the variance. So be very careful with your symbols. So be very careful with your symbols. So step one, still writing our hypotheses and stating our claim. Our symbol, be very careful. It might be little sigma, that'd be for standard deviation. Little sigma squared is going to be for variance. So in this case, we're dealing with variance, so we need little sigma squared. And the researcher is claiming that we're greater than 140. So 140 is the value of interest, and we're claiming that we're greater than 140. All right, step two is finding our critical values. So we need degrees of freedom to do that. Our sample size for this one, it's for a 13 year period. 13 year period, so our degrees of freedom will be 13 minus one. Degrees of freedom is 12. I also, I personally, I just also like to jot alpha down. You wouldn't have to but I always like to just jot it down at that point. And then I also like to make a note to myself what kind of test I have. And we have a right tailed. I just like to jot all those little things down. When it's all said and done, step number two, you need a critical value. How many other little things you jot down to get that, that's totally up to you. And I'm going to go ahead and draw my picture off to the side so I have plenty of room to write my other steps. All right, and we are a right-tailed test. So let's see if we can find our critical value. Let's go to table G. All right, table G. This one's a right-tailed test, so I don't have to do anything special with alpha. My degrees of freedom are at 12, and my alpha is at 0 0.01. Be very careful with the 0 0.01 and the 0 0.1. That can be a pretty common, easy mistake there. So again, degrees of freedom 12, my alpha is at 0 0.01. We are on table G. I don't have to do anything special with alpha for a right-tailed test. I get to use alpha as is. So we have 26.217. 26.217. Jot that down before I forget it. Oops. All right, so 26.217, awesome. All right, step three. We're going to find our chi-square test value. Not a super complicated formula, but again, with having that variance in there as part of the formula, if we really don't understand our symbols, we're going to end up squaring something that we shouldn't. So be very careful with this formula. We start off with an n minus 1. We start off with an n minus 1. And then in the numerator, we have little s squared. Little s squared is the symbol for sample variance. In this problem situation, for our sample, we are given the variance as 146. So into my formula, into my equation, I just put 146. I don't square it because that is the variance. s squared is the symbol for variance. I know it's kind of tough. It can be kind of tricky to have an exponent as part of the symbol for something, but the squared is taken care of already because that is the variance. Then same thing in the denominator. The denominator is little sigma squared, so that is our variance. I don't need to square it because little sigma squared is the symbol for population variance, 
and I am given variance in this situation. So just be very, very careful with those symbols. Otherwise, the formula is not super tough. There's not a lot to it, but that's one area where we can get some confusion. So roughly, and if you're wondering what to round to, I always go to the same number of decimal places as my critical value. That's just my general rule of thumb. So approximately 12.514. It can also take some getting used to where some of these values fall at on our distribution. Everything we come across is going to be positive. It's going to be positive. So my critical value of 26.217, I have to figure out if my chi-square is going to be less than that and over to the left or greater than and over to the right. So 12.5 something, uh, it's going to be somewhere way over here in that non-shaded region. So we do not reject. I'm going to write my summary statement up here. I suggest try to write yours before looking at mine. Hopefully we're at that point, guys. This is our last type of hypothesis testing we're going to run. Tomorrow's just gonna kinda put everything together and compare with our confidence intervals. So it's our last new type of hypothesis test. So if I do not reject the null hypothesis and my claims in the alternative, what does that mean? See if you know how to phrase it. So if we do not reject the null hypothesis and our claim was in the alternative, when we summarize it, we will say there's not enough evidence to support our claim. And then just restate your claim. So see how you're doing with that step number five. Still have some time to get it down. So just be very careful with that phrasing. So this would be our traditional method our traditional five steps, and again, focus specifically on finding those critical values in table G. The other type of hypothesis testing that we need to know, and again, you need to know the five steps for each. You need to know the order. You need to know what's required at each of the steps. Okay, we looked at the formula card, and we saw that the only thing on the formula card was formulas. That's it. So we need to know what the steps are. Same as with the traditional method though, I wanna focus specifically on how we use table G to find the p-value. <coughs> and for this one though, if you notice, we can only get an interval. It's like with our T distribution if you choose to use the table to find a p-value. Unfortunately, the table is our only choice. We don't have any technology available to us to find the p-value for us for the chi-square. So we do have to use the table for the p-value. So in order to do a p-value for a right-tailed test, what we need to do for p-value right tail, this is your test value. So that's gonna be what you find in step two. Step two for p-value is find your test value. Find your degrees of freedom, n minus 1. And what you're going to do is you're going to look for 
This is just like with the t-distribution, but I know for a lot of you, the t-distribution, you chose the calculator. And I told you to use the calculator because it's way more accurate, but this is all we have for this. Look for the two values. Look for the two values, the test value, in this case it's chi-square, 2, 1, falls between in the row. Yeah. for the correct degrees of freedom. Then we use corresponding alpha, that's a terrible alpha, not any better. There we go. And we use the corresponding alpha values. So we will come up with an interval. So we will come up with an interval of values. This is not going to be an exact value. And like I said, unfortunately, we don't have the technology for us to find the exact value. So we're going to find our row for our degrees of freedom. Look for the two values, our test value falls between, and we're gonna use the alpha values that match up with those particular columns. So let's take a look at this for table G. All right, so for this one, I will zoom in. I know I can't write and zoom at the same time unfortunately. All right, so our degrees of freedom, we had as 15. Our degrees of freedom, we had as 15. So what we want to do is go to that row for 15, and we follow it over until we find the two values that 29.321 falls between. So 29.321 is going to fall between these two right here. 27.488 and 30.587. It's going to fall between those two. What I then do is I follow those columns up. And my p-value will fall somewhere between those two alpha values that are up at the top. So we're looking at 0 0.025 and 0 0.01. Those are the two values. Those are the two values that my p-value will fall between. So we had <coughs> 0.025. and point zero one. Be careful when you write your interval. Make sure your inequality symbols are going the correct way. Point zero two five is the larger value, so your p-value has to be smaller than that, and it has to be bigger than point zero one. Now, I just pulled the order right from the table. When I looked at the table, it was 0 0.025, then it was 0 0.01. Typically, how you will see this written, typically you will see the smaller value first, followed by the larger. This is how you typically see it written. I wrote it the other way because I pulled the values right from the table, the order they were given in. It doesn't matter which way you write it. But you need to make sure you understand how to compare that interval with your alpha, which we will do. We will do a full-out hypothesis test in just a few minutes. So it's up to you which way you want to write it. Just make sure your inequality symbols are going the correct way.
If you check this answer, let's say, in your textbook, it will be written the way that I have it boxed up. They will put the smaller value on the left. That's how I prefer to write it. The top way is if you just grab the values right from the table. So that's for a right tail. If we do a left tail test, it's the exact same as right tail. Same as right tail. Then subtract alpha values from one. So we do the exact same process, exact same. We go to our row for our degrees of freedom, figure out where our test value falls, find the matching alphas, then we just subtract them from one. That's the only extra piece. That's the only extra piece. So our degrees of freedom for this one, I'm just gonna jot it down. Degrees of freedom is 24. So let's take a quick peek at table G. Degrees of freedom, 24. Mm -hmm. There we go. All right, so our degrees of freedom are 24, and we are looking for 10.215. So 10.215, and actually right out of the gate, it's going to fall between those first two values. So 9.886 and 10.856. So I follow those two columns up. The two alpha values up at the top, we have 0.995 and 0.99. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so we had... We need to do 1 minus, our first value is 0.995. And then we need to do 1 minus, our second value was 0.99. So when I followed those columns up, I found 0.995 and 0.99. I just subtract each from 1. Again, typically you will see it written, the smaller value will be on the left, the larger value will be over on the right. If you switch them, that's okay, but your inequality symbols also have to switch accordingly as well. So just be careful with that. We have one more type test, and then we will go through the full five-step hypothesis test with a sample problem. If we have a two-tailed test, we start the same as a right tail. So same as right to start. Same as right tail to start. Now here's where the two-tail can be a little bit of a pain. There's two different situations. You could have the two tails end up both on the left side of the distribution or the two tails both end up on the right. So, whoops. If the two tails, so if the two alpha values, not the two tails, excuse me, the two alpha values are on the, if they're on the left side of the table, The two alpha values on the left side of the table, subtract each alpha from one, and double it. So because it's a two tail, we have to add that extra piece in there of doubling it. Kind of the common theme, if you end up on the left side of the table, we need to be subtracting alpha from one. If both of your alpha values happen to be on the right side of the table, right side of the table, 
all you have to do is double each value. So for your two tail, you start the same as a right tail. Everything starts the same as a right tail. Everything starts the same as a right tail. If the two al alpha values that you find are on the left side of your table, subtract from one and double. If the two alpha values you end up with are on the right side of the table, we just double. Don't do anything else special. All right, so degrees of freedom for this one, we're looking at 10. Here we go. We're looking at 10, so I can zoom in a little more. There we go. And the value that we're looking for is 24.672. So if you follow across the row for 10, 24 24.672 is going to fall in those last two columns. So I'm seeing 23.209 and 25.188. I'm on the right side of the table. So if I follow those up, I have 0 0.01 and 0 0.005. 0 0.01 0 .005. 0 .001 and 0 0.005. Whoops. <coughs> So we had 0 0.01 and we had 0 0.005. We need to double both of those. Now, however you choose to write your interval is up to you. Again, typically the smaller value you put on the left and then you use less than signs. So all we had to remember to do was double those values that we found. So p-value chi-square test is probably going to be our most involved type of test that we have simply because we don't have any technology to help us out. So that p-value with the table, only being able to get an inter interval, it makes it a little bit tougher. There's a lot more pieces for us to have to worry about. So let's go ahead, one final example today, let's go ahead and refresh ourselves on the p-value method. So we have our machine fills 12 ounce bottles for the machine to function properly. The, san the standard deviation of the sample must be less than or equal to 0 0.03 ounces. A random sample of eight bottles is selected and the number of ounces of soda in each bottle is given. At alpha equals 0 0.05, can we reject the claim that the machine is functioning properly? It says use p-value method. All right, so let's go ahead and state our hypotheses. Be very careful when you state your hypotheses. We are focusing on the standard deviation. Don't change it to variance, don't do that. We can test for standard deviation, same way we wrote confidence intervals for standard deviation. So your symbol is just little sigma. And we are told 0 0.03 ounces. But this one, I chose this one specifically for this. Some of you have asked me about these, some of you have not. Less than or equal to. The equal to piece always is in the null hypothesis. The equal to piece is always in the null hypothesis. So that means, in the null hypothesis, we need the less than or equal to. Hang tight with me for just a minute on this. Some of you, I've assigned some problems like this. Some of you have asked me about them, some of you have not. So I wanted to make sure we went through one together. If that less than or equal to piece, the equal to has to go on the null, what does that mean the alternative has to be? Has to be a greater than. I can't have two less thans in there. 
Now, back when I first started teaching statistics, this is how you would have written your hypotheses. It wasn't just an equal to. Somewhere along the way, they decided, hey, let's simplify things. If the null hypothesis is always the equal to, let's make it that way. So if you want to write them this way, I'm totally fine with that. We want this to be our claim. We want the machine to be working. The other way you can write these is how we have been writing them, where the equal sign is always in the null. That's our claim this time. And then we still have just that greater than. I like the first way better, but I wanted to make sure I'm keeping up with the times. And so that's why I always showed you guys the equal to and the null hypothesis. If you have a less than or equal to, if you have an at least situation, the equal to piece has to always go in the null hypothesis. So I don't care which way you write them. To me, the first way makes more sense. But the second way is now what is customary when writing these. I don't care which way you do it. I prefer the first way. It makes more sense in my brain. So it's up to you how you want to write those. Step two, we have to find our test value. Step two is always our test value with p-value because that's what we use to find the p-value. <coughs> so we have our sample size is eight. Now we have little s squared. Just to save us a little bit of time, I know we don't have a ton of time left today. I had put this stuff in my calculator and I found that little s was approximately 0 0.043. This is raw data. I wanted to use this one to again talk about those rounding rules so we're all on the same page. The raw data that we would enter into our calculator is to the nearest hundredth, so two decimal places. So when I round any of my statistics, I go to three decimal places. I go one more. So from the calculator, I can only get little s. I can only get the standard deviation into the formula it doesn't matter it does not matter that I'm just testing standard deviation the formula is still variance I know standard deviation so when I substitute into the formula I can only substitute for little s squared is still there same thing in the denominator I am given a population standard deviation, I need the variance I have to square. So what you've seen today is a sample of each type. Our first sample problem, full out five step traditional method, we were given variance. We didn't square a thing. In this sample problem, we have standard deviation, so we have to square both places. You have to be careful on what you're entering into this formula. We end up with roughly 14.381. So for our p-value, we have a right-tailed test. Let me go to table G here real quick. If you have table G open, go ahead and look for it. We have a right-tailed test. And our degrees of freedom would be 7. Our test value is 14.381. So we're going to be in between 14.067 and 16.031. So if we follow those up, the two alphas are 0 0.05 and 0 0.025. And since it's a right tail, I don't have to do anything special. Now, when we go to compare, because it's an interval, it's very tough to make this visual. So when we go to compare, we're going to just use the rules that we have for comparing. It's hard to make this visual because we don't have the exact p-value. So our alpha 
We're comparing our p-value with our alpha. Our alpha is 0 0.05. Our p-value is less than that. So our p-value is less than or equal to alpha. So we would reject. So the area for our p-value, remember p-value is an area, that area would fit inside of our rejection area for alpha. P-value area fits inside the rejection area of alpha. So the p-value fits inside the rejection area, so we are going to reject. Our claim was in the null hypothesis. We rejected it. So there is enough evidence to reject the claim that the standard deviation is less than or equal to 0 0.03 ounces. Or you could also put that the machine was working properly. It's kind of up to you. Now, I knew today was going to be super long because we had to really focus on table G and those critical values and p-values, and it takes some time. So tomorrow will be a full workday for you on chi-square test.